Well, uh, I'm here uh, with uh, Dave Brennan, and uh, welcome, Dave. It's it's uh, it's great to welcome you here to uh, to the Tron Church. Um, Dave is uh, known to me, but uh, his brothers are much better known to me because uh, Dave's older brother is on our staff here and has been for a number of years, and uh, one of his younger brothers was on uh, the staff with us as an, as an apprentice for a while. So we're well acquainted with. Uh, with you and your family, but uh, less so with you, mm. and uh, it's lovely to, to mm. rectify that. Mm. Um, Dave's been with us uh, this week and uh, is speaking to various different groups of our church, and uh, including our students, our youth, and uh, all of our uh, home growth groups and so on. Um, and uh, so, Dave, let me, let me ask you to introduce yourself. Mm. Tell us, uh, tell us uh, who you represent, what you work for, mm. what it is that you're uh, you're doing with us up here. Sure, thank you. Well, thanks for having me on. It's great to be here uh, with you guys in Glasgow. So um, I direct a project called Brefos, a ministry at Brefos, which is designed to help churches to engage on the issue of abortion. So we, we focus on helping churches to teach about abortion first off, but then of course, we don't want to stop there just with hearing the word. We want to help the church be doers of the word. And so we're equipping, mobilizing the people of God to respond uh, to abortion indeed in as well. And um, Brefos is a, a project of the Centre for Biological Reform, uh, CBR UK, and uh, we've been involved on a voluntary basis, my wife and I, uh, with CBR for, it's coming on six, seven years now, uh, but it was about four years ago we felt the Lord leading us to establish a new branch of CBR, which was Brefos, because we saw the real need to be engaged in the church directly on this issue, because we could see there was a, 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 something of a, a, a hiatus there. Okay. How did you find your way into uh, this line of, mm. uh, of work and, and, mm. and ministry? What's your sort of background and how did, how did that mm. how did come about? So my background is I, I studied um, classics and theology uh, at Oxford, and it was during those years really that I started to come to know something of the scale of the abortion issue. And I think up until that point, you know, I'd grown up in a Christian setting. Uh, the pro-life position was kind of the default growing up. So I would, all, I would always have said I was pro-life, but really that didn't mean anything, practically speaking. I was very passive. And to be honest, I was naive as to what was really going on in our nation. So when I found out about some of the numbers, the scale of this thing, it began to dawn on me and a couple of friends I was speaking with at the time that this was the greatest issue of our day in terms of human rights, in terms of justice issues of the day. This was the big one of our generation. And yet looking around the place, I couldn't see anyone really doing much about it. And certainly in the church, it seemed no one was really talking about it. And so uh, for me, coming to know the, the scale of this issue was a big thing that, that kind of caught my attention. Um, and just, then, just let me um, um, stop you on there yeah. on that point then, because that's a big claim. Mm. Uh, this is the biggest, mm. uh, or even one of the biggest, mm -hmm. human rights issues mm. of our day. Mm -hmm. um, that would be a surprise to many people, actually. Mm. I'd, I'd be surprised if many people have thought of it in quite mm. those terms. So why is that? Yeah. Why is it such a big issue? So I think there are a few um, objective measures as to why we can say it's the greatest, or at least one of the greatest issues of the day. So first of all, just in terms of sheer numbers, in terms of the loss of human life, you know, if if a plane crashes, whether um, by accident or through an act of terrorism, what's the first question everyone asks? How many lives were lost? Mm -hmm. You know, the numbers of human lives lost tend to resonate with us because we all know at some level how, how meaningful that is, how significant that is. So in terms of numbers of human lives lost, we're talking about, in this country since 1967, some 10 million, in, in, in Great Britain, 10 million human lives deliberately taken through abortion, babies killed through abortion. Globally, we're talking something like 50 million a year. So about a million a week, every week, worldwide. Um, if we're to talk about over the last century, it's estimated that more than a billion babies have been killed globally through abortion. So it's just so we, beyond. So we're talking about adding together all the wars, all the famines, mm -hmm. all the pandemics yeah. and everything, and it doesn't even begin to it's, reach anything it, like the numbers. It's nothing like the numbers, yeah, it's nothing like... Abortion is the leading cause of death every year by a distance, including over the last year and a half. Um, and I think I'm right in saying that uh, in the UK, we're sort of approaching 
nearly a quarter of a million abortions that's a right. year. That's right. So, and, and to put that into perspective, that's about one in four babies. So for every three babies born alive, in England and Wales, for example, for every three babies born alive, one baby is deliberately killed. So this is not some niche, you know, only in extreme circumstances sort of thing. This is happening every day in, in, in you know, 800 times every working day in the UK, a baby is killed in the womb. So just the sheer scale of it, mm -hmm. it you know, take any other issue, let's talk about knife crime, let's talk about um, racially motivated killings, let's talk about even wars and famine, it just doesn't come anywhere close. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing I say, just in terms of the numbers. But I think there's more that we can say objectively. I think we look at the, just the, um, the sheer violence of abortion. Now we can talk about um, the, the, the bloodshed that takes place in warfare, and some would say, well, some wars are legitimate, sometimes it's necessary, it's regrettable, but you know, defending one's own country or whatever, there's a case for it. What we're talking about here is the very most vulnerable, the very most defenseless of all human beings, utterly innocent, and their lives are being taken in the most brutal fashion. So the, the, the violence of it, the inhumanity of it, in what's designed by God to be the safest place to be, is actually the most dangerous place on earth, the womb. And so there's something about the, just how um, egregiously evil that is, to, to attack the most innocent in what's meant to be the most safe place. And perhaps that connects to another thing, which is just in, in God's eyes, there is something about the shedding of innocent blood, uh, especially of, of babies. Mm -hmm. You know, children are close to God's heart. And so in God's eyes, there's something about this issue which is, is especially offensive. You know, of course, the shedding of any innocent blood is an outrage. But in God's eyes, we see the way Jesus reacted, even when people wouldn't let little children come to him. He, he, he rebuked them so strongly. And so how does he respond when these babies are being not just uh, dismissed as, as taking up valuable time, but actually deliberately killed in the womb? So I, I would put it to anyone who wanted to contest that. There are actually objective reasons for saying, yet yeah, this, is, this is the big one of our day. I mean, the numbers are staggering. And, and when you put it like that, um, it, it just seems so obvious. Mm. Um, and yet... It does seem to be an issue that really um, people don't think about him or mm. um, immediately uh, the argument goes, well, look, it's about my choice mm. or my body or, um, or they're not really, mm. it's not really a life, it's mm. not really a person. Mm. Um, one of the things that has, I think, changed recently, in, in more recent years, is that the, the sheer... Um, technology available now, mm -hmm. medical technology, imaging technology mm -hmm. in particular, mm -hmm. um, if people are aware of that, it really does make it almost impossible yeah. to to use the sort of, oh, this is just a mm -hmm. ball of cells argument. Yeah. Do you want to, do you want mm -hmm. to say a little about that? Because, I mean, that's often, I think people want to um, uh, hide mm -hmm. from from the, the violent taking of human yeah. life by saying, well, it's it, it, it's just a, it's just a ball of cells. Yeah. So there's the, there's that sort of euphemism, mm. and there's also a lot of sanitising of the language, yeah. isn't there, around mm. the whole issue, which which yeah. uh, I think is a significant yeah part of it. Mm. But what, what would you say to that? Yes, well, I think you know back in the nineteen sixties, for example, when the law was passed, the, mm. the Abortion Act sixty seven, they didn't even have ultrasound yeah. back then, and it's hard to imagine you know going for an ultrasound scan seems mm. so routine these days. Yeah. But they didn't even have an ultrasound. Okay, maybe you'd, later on you might be able to hear the baby's heartbeat or something. But so it's it's incomparable. The the, the visuals we have now on mm -hmm. the unborn child just blow your mind, and it gets better every every year. You know, mm -hmm. now we get four D ultrasounds, mm -hmm. and and we've even now got video footage of life in the womb. So it's not even reconstructive, you know, ultrasound technology, but literally you can see mm -hmm. video footage of life in the womb. So. Absolutely, nowadays it is undeniable. And that makes a big difference because any large scale sort of systemic injustice and accepted injustice, such as abortion, but we can think historically of the transatlantic slave trade, mm -hmm. they thrive on ordinary people not knowing what's really going on. And even mm -hmm. the Holocaust, you know, there were Germans mm -hmm. living not far away, mm -hmm. you know, just a few kilometers away in their towns, going on about their daily business with no idea about what was going on. 
behind those walls. Uh, and this is the way it goes, that the injustice is deliberately kept hidden. And uh, if it's unseen, it's tolerable. But you can flip that. When it becomes visible, when it is seen, it becomes intolerable. And, and that's part of our strategy, that as abortion is seen for what it is, it protests itself. And so these images are a, a, a wonderful tool in our hands because you can, you know, we were out on the streets a, a couple of weeks ago doing our public education work and some young people came and wanted to protest what we were doing and they had drawn their own handmade placards and one of them said something like, oh, it's just a bunch of cells and they just drew with their pen a picture with a kind of dot in the middle. But you hold that next to our um, embryology, uh, you know, correct embryology images Mm -hmm. And you can see the reality, and there it is. That you can see the fingers, the toes, mm -hmm. the, the eyes, the ears. And we know from as early as three weeks, there's a heartbeat. You know, there's a fingerprint at 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. So these really help us to get, to sort of colour in this understanding that there is life in the womb. It's human life. It's unique. It's precious. And uh, yeah, these, these pictures really help to bust that idea. Oh, it's just a bunch and of And I, I, I could see last night, I was looking around at people's faces when mm -hmm. you were showing those uh, intro, intro, mm. intro mm. Um, uh, video of six, seven, yeah. eight week old mm. uh, babies. Mm. And I think people were staggered. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I, I mean, they, they, what they were seeing was a sort of thing I think they might imagine at 20, yeah. 30 weeks. Yeah. But it's quite yeah. extraordinary the, yeah. the, the definition that's not as right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we never see these pictures, mm. Um, mm. let alone pictures mm. of surgical abortion. Mm. Mm. Um, these are never in the media. Yeah. Mm. They get censored on mm. YouTube. They, they, they're they deemed to be too horrific. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and that sort of argument, one can understand be, be, because they are very upsetting. Mm. Um, it doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem to apply to pictures of people uh, apparently in ITU dying of COVID. Mm. Or, yeah, so that's right. Yeah. They're pretty gruesome yeah. uh, pictures. Um, mm mostly concocted with actors actually mm, but mm. um wh what what is the situation mm. why is that what, yeah. what how, you know how do you are you engaged in trying to get these sort of things visible? Yeah. How, how, how does our country compare to other places is this is this um uh media being constrained by uh mm. you know, advertising standard bodies mm. what's, yeah. the, what's the story there yeah so you know it's um it's very common for us to, to hear the charge, oh, these, these pictures are too horrific, they're too violent. The, the reality is, as you say, be it COVID, be it uh, even a 12-rated film is full of violence and often mm -hmm. far more gruesome and drawn out than anything I would ever show uh, would ever want to. Cigarette packets these days. Well, that's right. You know, that's right. And I think that's a really helpful comparison because what's going on there? Those pictures are shocking. But what's their intent? Is there an intent to cause distress, to, to trigger people who've lost relatives to lung cancer? No. They, they show that because that is the reality mm -hmm. and they know that that makes a difference. It works. It changes people's thinking mm -hmm. and it changes their behaviours. And that campaign actually has been extremely successful. You know, mm -hmm. it's really brought down smoking levels. So the, the, the real reason, and of course the excuse is it's too horrific, it's triggering and so on, but the real reason um, those who are in favour of abortion and want to maintain the status quo, the real reason they want to suppress these images is because they show in an instant mm -hmm. that all the rhetoric is totally false. This isn't healthcare. It's not just a women's issue. Uh, what this is is the intentional and violent killing of an innocent human being. And those pictures show it instantly. They 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 make their own case without us having to say a word. Sometimes I'm out on the streets and, and we're talking to people, we're showing the images. And a number of times I've been standing there just with the image, and someone's coming up to me and they're saying, "What you're saying is wrong." I haven't said anything. I literally haven't said a word but they're, they're hearing the picture. The picture is speaking to them loud and clear. And what the picture does is, well, we, we, we have a saying, we don't protest abortion, abortion protests itself. Mm -hmm. We just have to unveil abortion. And it does all the talking for us. And time and again, people say, what you're saying is, and I haven't said a thing. These pictures speak for themselves. And that's why, even to this day, the abortion industry and those who support abortion want to keep these pictures out of the public eye because they really do make a difference and they they burst this bubble of well this is just healthcare. I mean I was very struck by your your um, film uh, showing the kind of advertising for a mm. for an abortion clinic mm. 
um, mm -hmm. which was, you know, it was a sort of motherhood and apple pie. Mm -hmm. Everything's lovely, mm -hmm. and you're coming in for a nice day and having cups of tea yeah. and sitting in rooms with nice flowers and yeah. uh, and all the rest of it, as, mm -hmm. as, as though it really was, you know, an annual dental checkup or yeah. something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but but that is the issue, isn't mm -hmm. it? The, the, the sanitizing. Yeah. And you spoke about the language. Mm, Just say, yeah. say a little about that because I, I do think that's very important that people need to be alert to yes. the weaponization of language that's right. and the changing of language. That's right. uh, very mm. often is the is the um, is the Trojan horse that's right. through which mm. um, very damaging things are, are, mm. are, are you know are, are brought in. Yeah, yeah. I think it's especially um, destructive that the use of language and so on in this country we, because abortion is so centralized the nhs essentially administers all abortions and so um it's ultra sanitized it all takes place behind you know red brick and um, walls and and you know behind closed doors and you know tidy looking professionals in white coats and and um and you know we we hear terminology like termination it's a termination of pregnancy or top 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 for termination of pregnancy for fetal abnormality now that's the kind of thing that can happen up until birth mm -hmm. we're talking about a gruesome process that can take even days to be completed so the, the, these these um, terms are deliberately used to sanitize to kind of euphemize and, and to give the impression that this is just a, a procedure like any other mm -hmm. and so whether it be using the word fetus instead of baby whether it's talking about termination rather than killing, um, it's it's all designed to normalise and to desensitise, and it's it's very similar to what we. I mean, just think how, how different really is this language from the final solution to the Jewish problem or the, the question? Well, we've got a solution here. It's not a solution. It's killing, They're exterminating vast numbers of Jewish people. But it was called a solution. Mm -hmm. Now we, we, we have very similar language today. Termination, it's a choice, it's healthcare, it's reproductive justice. Now all of these things are deliberately designed to detract from what's really going on. Mm -hmm. And it's very successful because you, you, you hear people parroting it. And yet there's an extraordinary um, uh, dichotomy, isn't there? Because on just the same NHS websites, mm -hmm. um, you, as you pointed out, um, from very early on, uh, it talks about scanning to see your baby, yes. and yes. Um, you know, making sure that you eat the right things mm -hmm. and drink the right mm -hmm. things, or don't eat and drink certain yeah. things because of the health of baby. Yeah. And it, yeah. uh, uh, and so on the one hand, yeah. if it's wanted, it's yeah. baby. That's right. And if it's not wanted, we don't want to think about yeah. it. It's uh, you never use the word baby. Yeah. It's yeah. Uh, cells. It's mm -hmm. um, products of conception. Mm -hmm. It's it, it's all of these sorts of things. Yeah. yeah. And yet, these two things are held side yeah. by side. Yeah. Um, in an extraordinary way. Yeah. It, it, it's quite staggering, isn't it? It is. The, the cognitive dissonance is is staggering. I remember. Um, going in for our, our younger daughter's birth a, into the hospital. And mm -hmm. it was very striking. There are posters everywhere saying, don't smoke and during pregnancy, it'll harm your unborn baby. And, the, and actually very graphic imagery of a mm -hmm. baby struggling with tubes and whatever. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, I just come from a day, you know, labor started, I just come from a day's work doing this sort of thing and seeing these posters. And then later on I found out that in that very same hospital, dozens of abortions were performed every year. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, there they are doing a terrific job for my daughter bringing her to birth and yet probably what just down the corridor or upstairs or I don't know where they're deliberately killing babies and um, and I think you know that the language um, sort of greases the, the the wheels of that cognitive dissonance if we use a different set of terminology it makes it a bit easier to pretend these are two separate things mm -hmm. but of course it's the same baby uh, that we're talking about it's just that we're in one in one instance we're preserving life in another we're killing but the language kind of, as it were, makes that possible. Uh, at least, you know, it, it helps people to live in that delusion, mm -hmm. to, to pretend that this has got nothing to do with that. Um, and again, it is what we've seen throughout history, where, where people groups have been dehumanised and put into a different category, so that they can say, well, yeah, we, we care about human rights, of course, but these are just Jews, you know, they're not, they're not, they're not like the rest of us. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's what we're seeing today. I, I thought it was a very striking thing that... Um in the early days of COVID and lockdown and so on, um, very great attention was given to ensuring that mm. one thing that must not stop is access to abortion. Yes. Yeah. And in fact, under the cover of COVID, mm. 
there's been a cranking up yeah. of uh, home abortion yes. and, and so on. Mm-hmm. And in some countries, in, I mean, in Northern Ireland, things were pushed through by the yeah. UK government. Mm-hmm. Um, in New Zealand, uh, I think probably the most liberal mm. abortion legislation yeah. in the entire world mm-hmm. has been pushed through, mm. uh, if I'm right, yeah. uh, right up until birth mm. for any reason whatsoever, mm. which is which yeah. is just an astonishing yeah. thing. Mm. Um, in a country which one would have thought, in a way, was relatively socially conservative. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. But it seems to imply that there is a very strong um, lobby mm-hmm. and a very purposeful yeah. movement yeah. driving this. Because yeah. in, in my experience, and of course I was a, a medical doctor myself before mm-hmm. I was in ministry, but no many doctors, uh, the vast majority of, of doctors don't like yes. abortion, don't mm-hmm. like having to deal with it. Mm-hmm. The vast majority of ordinary people, mm-hmm. if you get into a discussion mm-hmm. of it, nobody would say, oh, it's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they'll say, well, it's necessary, it's a, yeah. it's a necessary evil and all the rest mm-hmm. of it. Um, so in the general mm-hmm. population, you don't feel that there's a sort of drive for mm-hmm. killing babies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, and yet, um, yeah. it has become ubiquitous. Yes. So that would seem to suggest there is a very powerful mm-hmm. driving force mm-hmm. there. Um, yeah. and what is behind that and who yeah. is behind that? Yeah. How, how, how mm. has that happened? Because it's been a very, very se- successful yeah. campaign. If we're, if we're having a quarter of a million abortions a year and one yeah. in four babies, mm. I mean, yeah. that's one of the most successful yeah. movements in history. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You're absolutely right. You know, it, for an evil like this to prosper, you need lots of people to be, you know, apathetic, naive, whatever. But you need a, a smaller number of highly committed and quite intelligent um, lobbyists. And that's what we've had. So for almost 100 years and years now, we've got the uh, Abortion Law Reform Association. It's changed its name now to Abortion Rights, I think. But it's been this one organisation which, since about the 1920s, has been doggedly working at this, preparing legislation, looking for people on the inside. Mm-hmm. And it was they who, in the 1960s, um, approached David Steele, got him on board, and mm-hmm. they uh, got him to present a private member's bill, which then turned into the Abortion Act. Now, it's interesting that time and again, this is the way the abortion lobby has acted. It's not gone about drafting legislation in the normal way. It's often been through a kind of back door. It's been a private member's bill. It's been slipped in as an amendment to something else. Even with Northern Ireland, mm. That bill was nothing to do with abortion. Yeah. You know, the executive um, bill was, was not about abortion, and yet this amendment was slipped in. And actually, over the last couple of years, um, they've tried several times to put, essentially, decrim, total decriminalisation of abortion, abortion up until birth for any reason, effectively. They've tried to slip that onto the ends of all sorts of bills over the last two or three years, and thankfully they've been pushed back a number of times, and they, they, they have been defeated. But this is the way they go about things. They, they are relentless, they never sleep. When, when the pandemic came along, within days, not even weeks, within days, they had got this stuff passed. Again, not as a, an actual bill or as a normal act, but just they got the health secretary to essentially announce it, uh, kind of amidst all the smoke of you know, emergency measures and whatever. Mm-hmm. And there's an argument to say that what he's allowed there is actually illegal because abortions are meant to only take place in certain locations, mm-hmm. now in the home. But this is the way that the lobby is. They, they are tireless and um, they were absolutely poised and ready for the opportunity that the pandemic presented because what their goal is, is nothing short of abortion on demand for any reason, for no reason, up until birth, no questions asked. They want it available over the counter, come through uh, the letterbox. They want it absolutely on tap and um, the pandemic presented them with an opportunity for that because the, this pills by post scheme mm. means that a woman doesn't have to have a consultation. Uh, she may not even be pregnant. She might be pregnant beyond the limit that you're supposed to be for pills by post, um, but they don't care. They'll send the pills anyway. Um, after a brief conversation on the phone, all she has to give is an, an address that's true, that exists, and she'll get the pills. And, that, and, and once that's, um, as someone has said, you know, there's nothing more permanent than a an emergency temporary measure and uh, now that that's been passed albeit in theory only temporarily it's going to be very difficult to get that back and uh, the abortion industry and the lobby will be delighted that they're that bit closer to these pills just being like getting a packet of paracetamol from your local supermarket 
And what you described there is a very organized, mm -hmm. determined uh, lobby. Mm -hmm. um, who are their allies? Mm. Uh, in, 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 because this doesn't have to be a party mm. political thing. Or yeah. Perhaps it is, I don't know. But I mean, how, how is there a cross party uh, lobby within mm. in the Commons, perhaps in the Lords, that are determined to push this among colleagues? Mm. Or is it. What's what's your take on that? Yeah, so amongst the major parties, there is no pro-life party. So um, some parties are more pro-abortion than others. So at the last general election, uh, the Labour Party was actually um, pushing for full decriminalisation up until birth. It was quite quiet, but that was on their manifesto, full decrim of abortion. And the Green Party was quite similar, uh, mm -hmm. and the Lib, Lib Dems are similar. Now, the Conservatives traditionally have been a bit different. They allow it as a sort of conscience issue, there's no kind of three-line whip when it comes to abortion. Having said that, it's been on the Conservatives' watch that all sorts of things have been passed, including the Northern Ireland mm -hmm. Executive Bill. So we mustn't be naive in thinking, oh, that's the pro-life party. Um, but no, the, the abortion lobby, you know, we're, we're talking about, in some ways, a relatively small number of highly committed activists. I've been to some of their meetings. They're, they're, they're not that big, but they're incredibly influential because they managed to pervade um, the Royal College of Robson Guiney, they're in the Royal College of Midwives, the, the, the BMA, the, the you know, Medical Association. Um, they clearly got their hand in the media, the BBC, um, a lot of the mainstream newspapers. They've, if they want a message to get out there, it gets out there. Um, and when it came to the, um, the, the, the pills by post, the pandemic thing, the Christian concern have helped to expose some of the goings on there. The, the health secretary went one way and then went the other and then the lobby said, oh no, you don't. And he went back again. There was a sort of triple, I think, U-turn uh, within the space of a few days um, because the lobby kind of knew how to turn the screws. Um, so they're, they're incredibly influential. I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but you can see what they managed to achieve in the most sort of underhand ways uh, because they've got their people in, in high places and um, that's across the parties. What about the other side? Mm. What about those who are, like yourself, um, mm. opposed to this mm. and, um, and seeking to um, uh, bring a very different mm. kind mm. of lobby? Mm. It, would, it would certainly look as if it's much less organised, yeah. much less successful. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, by comparison, I mean, if, if you put it this way, if the church cared as much about saving babies as these people care about killing babies, we'd be in a different situation. You know, it's very common for... For Christians to say, well, look, I'm not sure it's the right time to talk about abortion, you know, it's, you know, we're, we're focused on this now, and, you know, but the, the abortion lobby never says it's not the right time to kill babies or to advance the agenda. So if we, yeah, by comparison, we're very small, we're very amateurish, we're very naive, and we're easily manipulated. So we are small in number in some ways, but at the same time, you know, what we find on the streets, for example, and, and elsewhere is there are lots of people out there in the kind of mushy middle. There are mm -hmm. lots of people out there who, yeah, they'll tolerate abortion in some instances. It's very rare to find someone who believes passionately in abortion for any reason up until birth. So, so those views are, are still quite extreme. They're outliers. Mm -hmm. Most people are persuadable. And actually, there are lots more people who are actually pro-life, you know, everyday people walking down the street, than we might realise. And certainly more than the mainstream media would let on. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a huge kind of latent... Um, segment of the population who are persuadable and indeed um, data that we have shows that amongst evangelicals among, in the church younger evangelicals for whatever reason tend to be more pro-life than older ones so there is something of a growing movement and actually just taking evangelicals as a whole I think for the first time in a while we're seeing evangelicals begin to engage on this issue in a fresh way whereas really for the last 50 years mostly it's been the preserve of the, Ro the Roman Catholics yeah, I want to ask about that. I think let's just um, stick on the on the church mm. uh, uh, at the moment because it it that certainly does seem to be right, doesn't it? Mm. Um, why do you think it is mm. that? I mean, obviously, liberal Protestantism, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one would maybe wouldn't expect to mm. have mm. Uh, much of this coming from, but mm. but um, evangelical and other Orthodox. Yeah. Uh, churches. Mm. Um, why do you think the Roman Catholic Church has been much more consistent on this and vocal on this? Because mm. when anybody thinks about this issue, mm. um, 
if, 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 if one is talking about it, it will often, somebody will often say, well, yeah, I'm against, I'm against abortion because I'm a Catholic. Yes, yeah. And, and you'd expect that. Mm. But it's not nearly as common to say, well, I'm against that because yeah. I'm a conservative Protestant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What, what, what do you think that is? Yeah, well, I think, I think the answer to the question, why, why are the Catholics so clear on this? I think that's relatively straightforward in that, um, you know, the Roman Catholic sort of um, center of teaching, you know, that the, 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 their central body of teaching has always been absolutely clear yeah. that abortion is, I think they would classify it as a mortal sin, I think is what they would call it, but it's ever so clear and has been from the early days of the church. Um, and so there's no doubt about what the official Catholic line is. So at least in theory, every Catholic is clear. Mm -hmm. Now, evangelicals, it's, it's, you know, it ought to be obvious because it's clear as day from Scripture. But in reality, the history has been um, quite turbulent. So in, in the early days of the church, uh, it was absolutely clear from as early as actually the, the, the Didache, so mm -hmm. pretty much 100 AD or so, one of the earliest Christian writings, it explicitly calls out abortion as you know, equivalent to murder, essentially, um, against the law of God. Um, but uh, along the way, some, some mixed thinking came into the church. So some sort of thinking from Greek philosophy to do with insolment and quickening and, mm -hmm. oh, well, you know, for the first few weeks, it's not really, it's not got a soul or whatever. So those sorts of ideas seeped in about a thousand years ago. Um, and then fast forward to the 1960s or well, and earlier when it was all brewing here, the reality is in the 60s, the evangelical church was absolutely nowhere. Mm -hmm. We just had nothing to say. In fact, worse than nothing to say. Um, David Steele said the most uh, impactful thing he read about abortion, and he said this helped to change his mind. He actually claimed to be a Christian, David Steele. He claimed to be, I think, I forget which church he was in. He, he was uh, of Scottish. Scottish Scotland. Yeah, so it was church Scotland, wasn't it? Now, he said that this document helped him to become a pro-choice Christian. And the document was the Church of England's official paper mm -hmm. on abortion. It was called uh, Abortion and Ethical Dilemma, I think it was called, mm -hmm. or Ethical Discussion. And um, it absolutely failed to establish clearly life in the womb from fertilization, the value of life in the womb. It didn't really nail any position at all. And the document actually finished with a suggested abortion bill, an abortion act, drafted by the Church of England. This is in 1965, I think it was, before the abortion act was passed. So the Church of England pretty much did David Steele's homework for him. They drafted an abortion bill for him, and it's pretty much the same as what eventually got passed. Very permissive, allowing abortions for all sorts of reasons, including social reasons. In fact, even it went beyond what actually got passed, because they talked about allowing abortion for any real or foreseeable social reasons. Mm. That's effectively abortion for any reason at all. I think David Steele has, um, I think he's on record as, uh, as expressing some regrets now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think that in, in, you know, in the 1960s, late 60s, the, the, when the bill was passed, the, there was never the expectation mm. that it would mm -hmm. lead where it's led. Mm. Uh, which is not to defend it, because mm -hmm. I think those with eyes to see could see that yes. it would lead. Um, but I think perhaps part of that is that you know you still had a much more Christianized culture, yes. a much more Christian morality, mm. um, and therefore, um, I mean, one of the one of the big arguments for getting through that bill was backstreet abortions mm. and dangers mm. to women. Mm -hmm. And I know I've talked to uh, to doctors mm -hmm. who were practicing then, mm -hmm. who you know would see mm -hmm. sometimes these things coming in and, mm -hmm. and women terribly damaged from yeah. that. Um, and of course, you know, what you see with your own eyes has an enormous effect mm -hmm. on, on things. But the reality is, you know, that is a drop in the bucket in comparison yeah. to mm -hmm. what has been unleashed yeah. um, uh, beyond that. But mm. it, it's, a, it's a terrible admission, isn't it, that it's a, it was a failure and a confusion of the church. In mm. other words, here was a case where the church was actually leading the nation, but leading them in a, yeah. in a terrible direction. Yeah. I mean, a very similar thing, I think. Um, I am told was the case here in, in Scotland with the um, uh, Scottish government being the first in the UK to, to push ahead with, with uh, homosexual marriage. Mm. Uh, and I've been mm. told that um, uh, from, from sources in the government that um, 
the Church of Scotland taking yeah. the lead on that and yeah. gave the green light yeah. to <laughs> the mm. Scottish Parliament. So, well, yeah. the Church of Scotland's gone here, here we've gone. So, we've got the Church of England and the Church of Scotland yeah. leading the nation as mm. they should do, yeah. but leading them away yeah. from the clear mm. uh, teaching of, uh, mm. of Scripture. And, mm. and, and that's something for which we must all feel great, mm. great shame, I think. Mm-hmm. But I think I think you're right. I think there's a there's a dichotomy. So I think among I've I've rarely met uh, professing Christians, and evangelical Christians, people who would say we're Bible Christians, mm-hmm. who would want to argue pro abortion. Mm-hmm. Almost universally, we would believe that it's mm-hmm. wrong, mm-hmm. but but there seems to be a great gulf between actually. Believing that and yeah. feeling that we should be somehow doing anything yes. about it, or speaking about mm-hmm. it, or um, uh, or, or anyway engaging in that yeah. way, and it seems to me that's where the the, yes. the problem lies. The kind of things that we often hear is, mm-hmm. you know, this is not a gospel issue, yeah, yeah. Um, or um, perhaps uh, we don't want to be seen as extremists. Mm-hmm. You know, some of people people often bring in, uh, you know. Uh, American mm-hmm. uh, things. Yeah. Oh well, we don't want to be. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's been so counterproductive. Yeah. All sorts of extreme things happen. Yeah. Now, you know, one can understand that mm. to some degree, mm. um, but it, they begin to look like a lot of mm. <laughs> a lot of excuses. Mm. Um, mm. What do you say about take yeah. about this is not a gospel issue, yeah. and that's a common thing that I've heard a lot in the last yes. two years about mm. all sorts of other things yes. not being gospel issues. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what is a portion not a gospel issue? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's right. I think I think since the sixties, the the doctrinal line has been effectively drawn. You know, thanks to Stott and Schaefer yeah. and yeah. John White and so on. So yeah, I think nowadays most evangelicals would agree in theory. But yes, we get these objections. You know, it's not a gospel issue. I think we have to try and be clear what we actually mean by that. What do we mean by it's not a gospel issue? Okay. Because actually, if you take um, I think history is a, you know, gives us a wonderful perspective on things. Because you think, look back at Wilberforce, mm. look back at Bonhoeffer. Mm. Did they just go off on one? Was that a distraction from gospel work? You know, Wilberforce, oh, come on, the slave trade. Okay, well, yeah, we wouldn't agree with it, but, you know, is this worth, is this, you know, and, and same with Bonhoeffer. Now, I think Bonhoeffer put his, his finger on it really helpfully because he said, you know, um, well, this is in actually early days. This is nineteen thirty-three, I think. The Aryan paragraph was was written by Hitler soon after he became chancellor, and uh, essentially it was asking the church to excommunicate from office any Jews. Yeah, so you couldn't be a Jew um, eth- ethnically uh, a Jew and hold you'd be a minister of the church. Mm-hmm. And um, Bonhoeffer said, look, if we accept this, if we if we go against what Scripture says about there is no Jew and Gentile, right? In un- in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. If we forsake that, um, we have violated scripture and our evangelism becomes heresy. That's what he said. He said our evangelism becomes a heresy. We're no longer the church, he said, and our evangelism becomes heresy. So the reality is if we, if we knowingly go against God's word, if we fail to, to testify to what scripture, if we fail to stand on scripture on that point where it's being attacked, as this quote attributed to Martin Luther says, mm-hmm. you know, if I profess in the loudest voice, you know, every proposition of scripture, except precisely that one that's being attacked in this moment, at this point, yeah. then I'm, you know, it's, it's all a pretense. So the, the reality is it's, it's on these battle lines that we prove what is our authority, mm-hmm. who is our Lord. Now, we don't get to choose necessarily where that battle was pitched in our day. You know, I might prefer to have lived in the time of the Reformation or who knows when, but the reality is these battles come and as the people of God, are we going to be found faithful on every word of scripture or are we just going to arbitrarily decide, well, that's not a gospel issue, that's not a gospel issue. And then what do you end up with? You end up with, okay, well, if I can at least say a simple formulation of the gospel, I consider myself to still be doing my job, mm-hmm. but I've forsaken the Jew, I've forsaken the unborn, I'm, you know, I'm happy for black people to be traded for, for coffee. Um, and, uh, and and you're left with very little. And the reality is that that's just not the Christian faith. The Christian faith is not simply telling a narrow formulation of the gospel. Yeah. It is about obeying and serving the Lord in every aspect of our lives. And I think I think the danger is these days we have a very almost a sort of Gnostic gospel where as long as we believe certain doctrinal things, we think we're 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 we're, we're off the hook. 
I think that's an important thing, isn't it? Because um, I, I want to, I want to be, I want to state as clearly as anybody that the mission of the church, the great commission of the church, mm -hmm. is not to a whole bunch of secondary things. Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. for making disciples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But of course, we do have to remember that when Jesus is making disciples, what he means is teaching them to mm -hmm. obey everything I've commanded you. Yeah. And so the evangelism is not making decisions, but making disciples. Mm -hmm. And therefore, um, what will those Christians do? Yeah. How will they live? Mm -hmm. What will what right what will there be their righteousness mm -hmm. that they display so that people give mm -hmm. glory to the Father in heaven? Mm -hmm. And as soon as you put it like that, well, it can't be the kind of righteousness that ignores yeah. apartheid. It mm -hmm. can't be the kind of righteousness that ignores slavery. It can't mm -hmm. be the kind of righteousness that ignores mm -hmm. um, killing of the unborn mm -hmm. in the womb. Mm -hmm. I think one of the one of the things um, that I think is may help people is, is considering, it was the, the um, distinction that Abraham Kuyper made between the church institutional and the church organic, mm -hmm. in the sense that the church, as the church, as the institution of the church, is great commission is mm -hmm. to teach the word of God, mm -hmm. it is to proclaim the gospel, it is yeah. to make disciples. Yeah. But the church is also organic, that mm -hmm. is, it is made up of every Christian and every yeah. person in their life, in yeah. the world, yeah. uh, and therefore what, to put it in a sort of simplistic way, this is not exactly what, what he was saying, but what we do in our gathering on a Sunday yeah. is one thing, yes. but what we do in the world Monday to Saturday yeah. is another, and, right. and that must be the implication mm -hmm. of the gospel yeah. that we're proclaiming, yeah. which is why the Wilberforces, the Clapham Saints, mm -hmm. the many, many others, mm -hmm. um, saw that very clearly, and, and it, it did grow, these things did grow out of not yeah liberal Protestantism, mm -hmm. but evangelical yeah. uh, revival, yeah. actually, in the, in, in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. And I think that perhaps among evangelicals today, because we've not wanted to, to turn the gospel mm -hmm. into a social message, mm -hmm. wanted to guard that, we've been yeah. very focused on the church institutional, but we've perhaps forgotten that yeah. that must spill out into yeah. the church organic and, and, yeah. and into all these other things. Yeah. And so there's been perhaps a, a, a quietism mm. uh, and a pietism. It's very striking with the death of Desmond Tutu uh, just recently because although, you know, I would have lots of uh, issues with Desmond Tutu's theology and his views on, on lots of things, I think it is unarguable that um, he was right mm. in the stand that he took on, mm -hmm. on apartheid. Mm -hmm. and. You know, he was a leader and he was extraordinarily effective. And actually, even in the post apartheid era, mm -hmm. and through the Truth and Reconciliation mm -hmm. Commission and so on, he had a very powerful mm -hmm. effect there. Mm -hmm. um, whereas there were other, I mean, he was the leader of the liberal mm -hmm. Anglican Church in South, in South Africa, but there are other denominations, much more conservative, much mm -hmm. more gospel oriented, who really took this view that this is not a gospel issue, we're yeah. not involved in that. But mm -hmm. the, the truth of the matter was, it did tarnish their yeah. witness, it didn't help their witness. And, mm -hmm. and many, many people just assumed that they were therefore pro-apartheid. Yes. And mm -hmm. actually, it, some have never recovered from that, mm -hmm. or it's taken a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And so, on this question of, well, you know, we, 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 don't, we want to have a good witness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, even if that is your aim, actually, yeah. It, yeah. it may not be the way you see it by not, you know, history will not look back. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. we, we see these things with great clarity, don't we, yeah. um, with hindsight. Yes, yeah. Um, but I think, I think that's a real challenge mm -hmm. um, for, for people today. What then, um, just sticking with, with the church, and of course it's not by any means only Christians who mm -hmm. are, 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 are against abortion. Mm -hmm. um, but that's our particular focus. Um, from your perspective, then, where where it's one thing to look at where and why the church has mm -hmm. failed, but where and how mm -hmm. have you seen, or would you like to see, mm -hmm. the church engaging? Where do you think we can, mm -hmm. uh, or, or Christians, the church organic in its yes. wider sense, yeah. Um, yeah, as well as uh, perhaps the church institution in terms of mm -hmm. its own its own teaching? What what mm -hmm. what, what constructive um, uh, things are you working for? Would you like mm. to see? Mm. Yeah, well, I think that I think that church institutional thing is a helpful thing, or perhaps a slightly different way of putting it is, you know, we're not asking pastors, for example, pastors and teachers. We're not saying 
you know, stop preaching, yeah. just, you know, forget services, you know, just become a, a full-time activist instead. That's not the message. The message yeah. is, look, the, the role of the pastor teacher is to equip the people of God for works of service. And, and this is one of them. This, this is one of those works of service. And so I think this ought to be, uh, so part one, I'd say, this needs to be an integral part of teaching the gospel uh, in church, on Sundays, midweek, whatever, whatever the format of teaching. This ought to feature very highly. Why? Because the word of God is clear on it and it's happening in our culture. You know, how, how can we not bring the gospel to bear on this issue when one in three women in our nation has at least one abortion? What, what gospel do we believe if we think it's got nothing to say to that? You know, so we've got a really sort of narrow, small gospel if we think that it has nothing to say to that or, or if it can't handle that, you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm passionate about the fact the gospel is big enough for this. You know, we've got to believe that, we've got to preach that, that this is not beyond the reach of the gospel. And, you know, for the sake of those women who need the gospel ministered to them, and men, post-aborted men, who need the gospel um, ministered to them on this specific area, we've got to be teaching on it. Uh, and to defend those, first of all, within our churches as a basic safeguarding responsibility who are abortion vulnerable, but also beyond, loving our neighbours outside the church. So I would love to see um, pro-life activism of various kinds become as normal for the church as running a food bank or Christians Against Poverty. You know, it shouldn't be this strange fringe, mm -hmm. you know, we treat with caution and, and even disgust and, and sort of think, oh, no, this is, as you say, we don't want to be like the Americans. We could spend a bit of time unpacking that idea. But, you know, at the moment, it's just not normal in the UK for a church to be talking about this, for a church to be engaging on this. And yet, it really ought to be when we consider how this weighs on God's heart, what the scriptures have to say, and positively, the incredible opportunities. You know, even just evangelistically. I mean, some people think, oh, this will detract from the gospel, it will burn bridges, it will get in the way of evangelism. We find precisely the opposite. When we're out on the streets talking about abortion, we find it very easy to then share the gospel. Mm -hmm. Because you're talking about what really matters, mm -hmm. what be it beliefs about what happens when I die, can I be forgiven, you know, why is life valuable? What mm -hmm. do you think and why? These are these are the big questions. And you know, I think we're living in an age where it's these anthropological questions, these ethical questions that are the big questions of the day. And if we're not there to be found, you know, bringing Christian worldview responses, compelling, engaged responses. We're missing a real gospel opportunity, actually. So I've certainly found that. I mean, in this mm. past uh, couple of years with the pandemic and lockdowns and all the rest of it, there's been an incredible amount of uh, questioning. Mm. Uh, I've certainly had far more engagement with with complete strangers mm. who've gone in touch, mm. and and it's been they've been drawn in through big questions yes. and and this whole issue of what it means to be human. Yeah, I think yeah. that I think that's right. I think mm. it is the great expert. Yeah existential question of, of, of our age mm. and of course all that's happened recently has, has thrown that into great uh, very sharp focus because mm. is you know what is life mm. uh, you mm. know if 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 to preserve life mm -hmm. you destroy life mm. or life as a, 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 mm. you know relational life mm. if you lock poor old people up yeah. so they don't catch a virus mm. for for the last year of their life mm. so they don't see anybody that, that kind of thing has really mm. made people mm. ask these sort of questions. Mm. Uh, 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 and so I think, and, and, and the answer, and, and the, our answer is not, uh, or our way into that is not a little narrow um, John 3.16, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. but it's actually a much broader thing saying, well, look, yeah. all of your questionings about yeah. life and humanity and everything, yeah. there is only one of you of the world that puts puts mm -hmm. this together yeah. in such a way as meets reality, meets yeah. your emotional mm -hmm. understanding of these things, your existential questions. Yeah. And it's the Christian worldview, yeah. it's the view of scripture. Yeah. And so um, I think this is another mm -hmm. another instance of exactly that, yeah. whereby um, things that touch deeply on, yes. on our humanity mm. um, are the things which then help us to begin to want to explore mm -hmm. that humanity and actually yeah. answer the questions yeah. which are gnawing away in people. So, so that's very interesting that you find that on the yeah. streets. Yeah, and I think there's, there's real biblical precedent for that. You look at the way Jesus evangelised, yeah. and he didn't tiptoe around the hot-button issues. He went straight for the heart. You know, he talked to the rich man about his money. He talked yeah. to the woman at the well about her, her sex life. You know, he just didn't do what we do. And we've got this kind of very British, perhaps, mm -hmm. mentality of we don't want to tread on toes, we don't want to raise the, the thorny stuff. And, and I've certainly been there, and perhaps that's my default. You know, I don't want to upset people for the sake of it. 
Um, but we've, we've turned that into a methodology for evangelism, and I just don't think it's biblical. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, you know, it might be, uh, there might be moments of tension, there might be conflict, there might be persecution, but I think biblically, going after those hot button issues actually is really fruitful. And, um, and, and again, that's because the gospel does touch us at every level. Mm-hmm. And uh, if we're not acting like that's the case, then I wonder how much we've really grasped the, the, the depth of it. Yeah, I think, I think it's hit on something there. I mean, I think there are cultural issues, aren't there? And, and we've got to be realistic about that. And, mm. and probably there is a sort of uh, British reserve. Mm. We're, we're, we tend to be more understated. We tend to sort of, um, we're not out there, mm. perhaps, as, um, as other cultures are. And, and maybe in, across the Atlantic, mm. um, in lots of ways, it is a more open and in your face sort of culture people yeah. are less reticent about mm-hmm. you know getting right to the, mm-hmm. the hot button issues and so on um, but viewed from here I think mm. we we see um, we see things that we're reluctant to mm. import I mean there's a great politicizing isn't there or mm. polarizing mm. Uh, in American Christianity because um, perhaps a liberal Protestantism has, has, has very much backed yeah. liberal mm-hmm. <laughs> parties, uh, conservatives have then, you know, it's, it's basically Republicans versus yeah. Democrats, yeah. right versus left, mm-hmm. and, and a, a, a big gulf in between, and abortion is very much parked on, mm-hmm. on one side of the political spectrum. Mm-hmm. In this country, we've, we've been much more reticent mm-hmm. for the church to... to, to you know, get into that party political divide. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a different, it's yeah. difficult to see. It's a different yeah. political spectrum and all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. But so there are issues to do with that, and there and then there are issues to do with um, what may seem to us to be a very aggressive, mm-hmm. in your face kind mm-hmm. of campaign, and which mm-hmm. people feel they instinctively recoil from and feel, well, how, how can I? That, that how does that fit with Christian compassion? Yeah. yeah. Um, so there are a lot of issues mm-hmm. there, a lot of difficulties, and yet. The other side of it is that we look across and we see that certain states in the, in the United States have, have rolled back yeah. uh, abortion legislation mm-hmm. in ways that you know, we've never seen and mm-hmm. perhaps we'd like to see. So there's, <laughs> there's things that we crave, there's mm-hmm. things that we cower from. Mm-hmm. And, 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 mm-hmm. and I think that's a big issue for lots of people in working it out themselves. So you've obviously thought a lot about that. Mm-hmm. Um, what, 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 would you, what would you have to... Yeah. To offer. Yeah, I think I think this is probably the greatest hang up there is in terms of people's stated reasons for, for being hesitant about doing anything at all. Yeah, it's this, and this is probably why I hear more than anything else. But we wouldn't want to do it the American way. Yeah, and, and you're right. People are looking across the pond and they're seeing something. They think, well, we don't want to be like that. Now, I think a, a really important question we have to ask is when we when we think we're looking at the states, what are we mm-hmm. actually looking through? Yes, we're we're looking through at least two layers of of generally pro-abortion media. Yeah. And they're very skillful at demonizing pro-lifers. And mm-hmm. so it's very common for people here in the UK to believe um, these sort of slurs, essentially. So for example, oh, pro-lifers only care about, it's their pro-birth, they don't really care about babies once they're born. You know, oh, are they gonna adopt every, every baby and so on? And there's this idea that they're generally heartless people mm-hmm. who just have this mm-hmm. political uh, drum to bang and they don't care about them. now. I, I know a good number of pro-lifers in the States. Uh, for example, uh, two of my best friends in the States who are both directors of pro-life organizations, one of them has adopted a son, the other one adopted three girls. Um, uh, they're both campaigning um, you know, passionately. One, one of them's helped hundreds of mothers to keep their babies, mm. um, uh, if not thousands. I, I forget the exact numbers, but he's, he's been 30 years running a pregnancy center in New Jersey, just plugging away faithfully. Um, it, if you look at how many millions of dollars US Christians have given to help mothers keep their babies, I mean, it's incredible. Now think about the other side. How many dollars have the pro-choice side given to women to help them keep their babies? Not a cent. Okay. So there are all these um, accusations that get thrown around, and they're generally groundless. Um, now, of course, you'll find examples of where a pro-lifer has been insensitive or perhaps has been just totally inappropriate. But I, 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 I could give you countless examples of where, be it on the streets in this country or friends in America, where 
pro-abortion advocates have assaulted pro-lifers on the streets. Um, I, was, I was involved in some displays in Ireland not long ago. Someone came up with a knife and slashed our banners. Okay. Mm. What did the media say? Of course, nothing. What did the police do? Nothing. Imagine if I pulled out a knife. <laughs> you can imagine the headlines. You know, deranged pro-lifer. Yeah, no, I, th I, think, I think that's a very, very important point, actually. And again, that's something that I think we've seen perhaps with greater clarity, particularly in, in, in recent times, is beginning to realise that what the media shows mm. us is is, yeah. is a very, very slanted. Yeah. Uh, it is not news reporting. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the difficult things that particularly an older generation have because you know, the BBC is mm -hmm. the source of yeah. impartial That's right. truth. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Lord, we've been laid to rest a long time ago mm. and it's mm. a very, very different thing now. Mm. And, and so we have, as you say, our media reporting what they yeah. get from American media. So That's we've right. got a double layer of, yeah. uh, of, yeah. of, 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 of very yeah. slanted and anti-pro-life. Yeah. Uh, mm. So that's a, that's a really mm. helpful point. So actually, what we think mm -hmm. is going on is mm. very, very different yeah. probably from what is. You know, I mean, I've, I've not spent a huge amount of time in the States, but from where I'm standing, I would, I would stand by and defend pretty much any pro-life activism I've, I've witnessed or been a part of, uh, certainly in this country, and, and any that I know firsthand in the States. These are generally people who are very peaceful, very loving, very committed, they would never harass anyone. They'd never threaten anyone. They're, they're doing a great deal of work um, at their own expense. That's very helpful and actually very encouraging to hear. Um, but nevertheless, mm -hmm. uh, maybe loving people wouldn't hurt anybody, etc. etc. Mm -hmm. But I think there are a lot of people who might see even a very quiet, silent mm -hmm. protest yeah. uh, near yeah. the maternity hospital uh -huh. or whatever. Um, we have that here quite often, uh, yeah. they're, they're kept at a distance and I've mm -hmm. seen people are just standing maybe with placards very mm -hmm. quietly, mm -hmm. doing nothing. But, but some people feel, is that, is that the wrong place, the mm -hmm. wrong time? Is, yeah. uh, you know, are you, a woman going in to have an abortion is in a very vulnerable mm -hmm. position, mm -hmm. really. Emotional time and so. Yeah. What's your feeling about that yeah. kind of thing? Because I think that that's an mm. issue for people. It is. It is. And I think you know. First off, if if we really truly grasped the humanity of the unborn child, our first thought would be that's a very vulnerable place for a child to be at that time. Mm -hmm. And that would be forefront in our mind. Not because that child's more important than the mother, but because the risk to that child in that moment is far greater than the risk mm -hmm. of the mother. Mm -hmm. Now we're there for mother and child. But first off, I think if we really, if it was toddlers, if people were taking their toddlers into a clinic to have their toddlers put down, I don't think we'd be having this conversation. I think we'd, we'd all just say, well, of course, you need to be there. Mm. If you save one life, fantastic. Um, but I think it really comes down to what, what we understand this term loving to, to mean or compassionate. What does it mean to be compassionate? Now, it, you know, being outside the clinic, which I've done many times, it, it, is, a, it is a tense place to be. There are people coming in all sorts of states. Some are very abortion minded, some are being coerced, some don't know what they're heading towards. Um, but what does it mean? What does true compassion mean in a situation like that? Now, as Christians, I don't think we can divorce compassion from truth. So if I'm withholding the truth from someone who needs the truth, I'm not being compassionate. Now, will they thank me for that at that moment in time? Maybe they will, maybe they won't. You know, some people have said, yeah, the first response to truth is anger, you know. Mm. And, you know, some will receive that truth, some won't. Now, it's important how I conduct myself. It's important that I am respectful, I'm compassionate in my tone, etc. But we absolutely hold that showing the truth and holding out an, an alternative, an option, a help for that mother to keep her baby. And we can't force her to take that. And, and you yeah, know, we don't try to because you can't. I mean, what can you do? But we show the information and we offer that support. And uh, actually, uh, you know, many of them do thank us. And sometimes we don't always know what will happen next. You know, I remember there was one young lady we all prayed with uh, on the streets outside the clinic. She went home that day. She didn't go in for the abortion. Did she go back another day for the abortion? I don't know. Sometimes we won't find out. But she certainly interpreted what we were doing as loving. Mm -hmm. Others might not. But I think we've got to um, come before the Lord and say, well, Lord, what, what do you say is loving? What, what, is your, what does your word say is loving? And Jesus certainly wasn't thanked by everyone that he sought to love. Uh, and indeed, he and the other, and all the disciples pretty much were put to death. 
as thanks for what they were doing for those around them. So I think we've, we've really got a problem in the UK in particular, perhaps, where we think that um, being compassionate, being loving is basically defined by reception, mm-hmm. you know, how people appreciate it in the moment. And I think that's a real dangerous concept of what it means to be Christ-like, to be loving, because the reality is um, Jesus said, blessed are you when people hate you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of things against you. Mm-hmm. And so I think uh, we, as evangelicals in the UK, we need to do a bit of heart searching. And, yeah, we've got to try and make sure we're not being deceived by the media, but fundamentally, we won't be able to avoid sometimes being misinterpreted, falsely accused. And the question is, are we up for that? Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't set out to be misinterpreted, but um, it's going to happen, especially if it's happening, the, 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 the exception and justice of the day. I think that's very, very helpful. Um, I mean, we forget very easily that, you know, when we talk about having a good witness, mm. is that mm. the very word witness is the word martyr. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, a good witness, you know mm. somebody's having a good witness when they're throwing stones yeah. at them yeah. and trying to kill them. Mm. Uh, you know, Christ had a mm. good witness. Yeah. The apostles mm. had a good witness. Mm. And actually, uh, Jesus... Uh, when he talks about the future for his followers, said, you know, they will haul you up against mm-hmm. kings and courts yeah. and public officials and so on, mm. uh, and that will be your opportunity for witness. Yeah. So, uh, in a sense, you're not witnessing yeah. unless there's opposition. Mm. Mm. Um, and it's not that you're looking for opposition, mm. but that the truth divides, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and there will be that. Mm. And I think that's, mm. that's very helpful. Obviously... Um, the point at which somebody is going through the door to have their abortion mm. is it, it, it's almost too late, mm. and in most cases it yeah. will be too late. Mm-hmm. Um, so the question comes then: Well, what what can be done mm. before mm. that time? Yeah. Obviously, you don't want to get there. You yeah. want to have somebody yeah. long before that. Yeah. Now, what in practical terms um, yeah. can be done? All the state um, paraphernalia is there. Um, supposedly to give support mm. and choice and all mm. the rest of it. But I think we know mm. in, from experience, yeah. vast experience in real life, that yeah. actually it's just a gentle walk yeah. along the corridor to the, right. to the abortion suite. Mm. Um, what can be done practically? What have you seen done? I know that mm. there are different churches and different Christian groups get involved in different ways mm. with um, pregnancy advice and, and, that, and that kind of mm. thing. But what have you seen yeah. that is effective? Mm. And what have you seen that is... Um, is possible <laughs> yeah. because people might feel well this is terrible I, I, I want to do something what mm. can I do mm. or, or even the church might feel very convicted mm. uh, and I think you know, many in our church will feel very convicted having, having seen your presentation and listened mm. is there a thing are, are there things that a, a, mm. an ordinary church and ordinary people mm. can do yeah. against the whole massive yeah. wall of Mm. Um, mm. Uh, of, of, of this process yeah absolutely there is and I think you know in some senses we're very privileged to live in an age where we have the kind of technology that enables us to do what we need to do very rapidly because um, an injustice like abortion an accepted hidden injustice it thrives on the dark mm. it thrives on people being unaware as to what's actually going on and that's why as we said the pictures are suppressed that's why the language is all twisted and turned and so there's a very simple thing that we can all do in various ways at various levels, which is help to show the truth, to bring the truth of this issue to bear, be that in the streets, in schools, in churches, uh, social media. It's incredibly powerful. And we've got the truth on our side. And it's incredibly powerful just to simply display visually, using pictures, using words, facts. The science is there it's, and it's becoming increasingly well known. I mean, it's incredible um, to see, you know, 4D ultrasound footage of your own child or whatever and people are often posting that online and you know here's my baby at 14 weeks or whatever it might be so we've got this huge wealth of of evidence at our fingertips and and the history of social reform shows us that such an integral component in seeing an injustice ended is exposing it you know be that the transatlantic slave trade with these very arresting images of a slave uh, a man saying am i not a man and a brother uh, the Brooks slave ch- uh, ship, you look at the civil rights movement, child labour at the turn of the century in, in, in the States, you know, you name it. These things, even before the invention of, of the Kodak, mm-hmm. we had pictures playing such an important role. 
And so we can absolutely see a lot of minds change, a lot of lives saved, and in God's goodness, we've, we've seen that through our work, um, simply by sharing the truth. And of course, there are other components. We need to pray. We need to try and tackle the, the issues, that, the, the other issues that feed into this, you know. But that's such an important one. And I think that's the one that maybe doesn't come very intuitively. In our British culture, we think, oh, that's a bit much, you know, it's a bit uncomfortable showing that and so on. But we just, here's the thing, we, we just cannot find a single example in the history of social reform. We can't find a single example of a reformer who prevailed by covering it up. You know, by helping to keep mm -hmm. the injustice hidden. And yet today, that's what many would have us do. Mm -hmm. so, so that's a, a huge component. And there are other things we can do as well. You know, and, and there are... how, how, did, how In practice, though, yeah. your organisation is devoted to that. Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that people could do is find out more about that, yep. perhaps get yep. involved. I mean, how, how, what, yep. what, yep. Uh, what actually do you do? So, we, so our public education, I mean, we, we love to get into schools, universities, etc. if we can. It's very difficult. But if you can get the platform, brilliant. I'd take that any day over going out in the streets because if you can talk people through it, very powerful, you can really shape their understanding. Um, but, but the streets are very effective as well. And what we do on the streets is we show on big banners very detailed imagery of life in the womb. So a living embryo, maybe 10 weeks in, in, in great detail. Uh, and we also show what that same baby looks like after the act of abortion. So we show you the violence visually of abortion. And I think, as I mentioned already, we, we, we're not protesting abortion. We don't have to. Mm -hmm. We just show it. And when seen, abortion protests itself. So we show these images, we engage people on the streets, we talk to them, and we use you know, cameras to, to multiply that impact on, on social media. So a lot of people are tuning in from around the country, watching what we're doing on the streets live or later. And so a single display can reach you know, thousands of people in one day. Uh, with the reality, and mm. and sometimes we get feedback of, of minds changed and, and, and lives saved. Do you find much hostility on the streets? We can we can find hostility. It, it does vary quite a lot. You know, I've been on displays which have been extremely peaceful, hardly any drama at all. I've had others where we've had you know there've been six of us, and about fifty <laughs> have come out against us. You know, with, with bed sheets and homemade banners covering our things, and they always want to cover it up. That's quite interesting. They always want to hide the truth. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not just a counter-protest, they're blocking our demonstration. Um, so it really varies. I mean, rarely has it ever spilled over into anything. You know, we've, we've never really been, we've never felt unsafe apart from once. A member of my team was assaulted once uh, in Norwich. But generally it's, it's peaceful, you get a bit of mm -hmm. opposition, a bit of hissing and whatever. Um, but it does vary from city to city. You know, some of the more liberal strongholds. Uh, you know, uh, like Norwich, where I am, or Brighton, you know, a lot of the university towns actually can be quite quite opposed. So the most liberal are the most intolerant. Yes, exactly, exactly. I should probably stop using the word liberal. It's a strange definition. Yeah. That's, that's um, the, the sort of public exposure education mm -hmm. side of things. Mm. What about um, the woman who finds herself yeah. considering an abortion? Yeah. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? Because there are, you know, I know that there are uh, pregnancy crisis centres, yep. for example, that mm -hmm. have been set up sometimes by groups of people, sometimes yep. by individual churches and so yep. on. What's, what's your experience of mm -hmm. that? Um, mm -hmm. Do they work? Are they yeah. effective? Do yeah. people go to them? Yeah. What, what mm -hmm. can they actually offer? What, yeah. Is that the sort of thing that it's worth a church thinking about, yeah, for example? Absolutely, absolutely it is. You know, um, there, there are quite a number of centres still around the UK today. Um, and what I'd say is the most effective ones by far, and this might sound a bit silly to say, it should, perhaps this sounds like it should be obvious, but the most effective ones are the ones that are very clear about the facts of abortion. So I'm thinking, for example, there's a, a, a one in um, Newcastle, a Tyneside Pregnancy Advice Centre, a chap called Chris Richards, um, a doctor there, uh, helped to, to found that. And they use an ultrasound machine. And so they show the life of the baby uh, in the womb. Um, and, it, and, and they say that that does most of the talking for them. You know, they, they do give advice and further information, but just seeing the reality of life in the womb. So you mean a woman comes in, Yeah. And they say, would you like to see your baby? That's right. That's right. And they pretty much all say yes. And that's often the end of the conversation. So most of the women come into that, that centre um, 
A little bit early on because they want to be for a scan. That's right, quite yeah. early on. And, and so the, the, the technology there is really good, you know. And, and nowadays we can get really good definition even mm -hmm. if that's domestic. So that's, that's fantastic. I mean, that sounds like a bit, a bit sort of beyond the scope of most places. Yeah. Right? How much do these machines cost? Yes, I mean, they are thousands and, and there's the insurance and so on as well. So, so that's one way of doing it. And that, they're very effective. You know, most of the women coming in there are abortion vulnerable. They're undecided. Mm -hmm. Almost all of them keep their babies. So, you know, praise God for the work they're doing. And there are mm -hmm. just two or three other centres in the country doing that. Sadly, many pregnancy centres in the UK um, won't do that. They don't want to be too candid about the facts because, sadly, many, even the, the, the Christian ones, have actually adopted this kind of secular counselling model, which is, well, it's not for me to direct in any way, or look, if she doesn't use the word baby, I won't use the word baby. I'll only reflect kind of where she's at and... Mm -hmm. They focus very much on circumstances and feelings and they don't talk about the reality of life in the womb or what abortion does. So I would advise caution to anyone looking into this. Your nearest pregnancy centre may not actually be using what you might deem to be reconcilable with biblical counselling, actually sharing the truth in love. Mm -hmm. Many of them use this secular kind of, essentially um, non-directive, kind of morally neutral, uh, you know, as if abortion might be the right thing for them. You know, so that's just and, and just kind of hoping that some of them might. That's right. Yeah, them. yeah. So it may well be well intentioned, but I, I, I find that the model they've adopted, many of them problematic. So there, there are a few that I think are doing an amazing job, uh, such as Tyneside Pregnancy Advice Centre. And actually, we're in the process of setting up one ourselves. And that, what we've opted for is, as I say, you know, you need thousands for an ultrasound and so on. But you know, we, and that's fantastic if you can. But but you know. Even just showing the imagery, mm. the pictures, the facts, you know, that's very impactful as well. And so I think as long as you're telling the truth in love, and as long as you're giving life-affirming advice and support, and again, at the end of the day, it will be her choice. You can't force, you can't change. You, you know, we're in a country where if she wants to go down that route, she'll be able to. Mm. But what we can do and what we must do is offer the truth in love. Um, and we and we're setting out to be explicitly gospel centered in the way that we're doing it. So we see in this instant uh, there is a, an evangelistic opportunity actually mm -hmm. to share not only life affirming information but gospel hope mm -hmm. in that moment. And that's really been inspired by this friend that I, I referenced in New Jersey, who's seen hundreds of women come to Christ, as well as hundreds of women keep their babies over the last thirty years mm -hmm. uh, through this ministry. And he's seen it very fruitful evangelistically. So you know, we're not going to go down the route of an ultrasound machine. We're going to show pictures, we might have a screen to show videos and so on. Uh, but ultimately, it's about, you know, meeting those women at their point of need mm -hmm. and, um, and being that voice, which they may not have anywhere else. There might not be anyone else saying, hey, you can do this. There's another option here. What sort of um, resources does, does something like that take? I mean, do you have to have people who are highly trained? Is it something, you know, that do you need? How many people do you have? Yeah. What, what, it, what actually would make it possible? It, it, so it depends what route you're going down. If you're going down quite a medical route, if you're going to have an ultrasound machine, mm -hmm. you obviously need the machinery, you need special training for that. You don't actually need to be a doctor. You can get training just for an ultrasound, but there's insurance and, and so on. And of course you need a building. Mm -hmm. The route we're going down, and, and this, is, this, this project we're setting up is called Hope Pregnancy. It's a new project and um, we've actually decided to get a, a van. So we're, we're going to be operating out of a, essentially a, a large camper van, um, which we're going to take to different locations in the city. Um, probably going to take it to a regular location, same time every week so people get to know it. And so we're taking an approach which is we're going to be, you know, people can make appointments or it'll just be ad hoc as we find people. People come on, there'll be a trained advisor uh, trained by us, uh, not not a medical professional. Uh, neither is she um, what we would call a, an accredited counsellor, because that tends to, in this country that tends to mean you've gone down the secular mm -hmm. counselling route. Mm -hmm. You know, you're in with the BACP, whatever it's called. You know, uh, which means adopting that secular, essentially mm -hmm. pro-choice model. So we've decided against that. And so yes, there's training, uh, and there's quite a large manual we've actually written from scratch in the end with, with help of our friends in New Jersey. But we've, we've got a manual, we've got training, and my colleague Rebecca is currently training up two or three other people. And we're eager to work with churches who want to do this. And so they don't need to be medical professionals. They don't even necessarily need a building space. Mm -hmm. uh, they can go down the route that we're going down with the van. Um, but really, I think, you know, the, the church in the locality is best placed to know how they're going to go about this. You know, in terms of the logistics, you know, here, for example, you've got a building, maybe it's a great location, fantastic, you've got your shop front. We don't have that where we are, 
and so we've gone down the route of a van. Mm. But I think the, the essence of an effective ministry in this area is, I believe, keep the gospel central and make sure that you're forthcoming with truthful information so that it really is informed, that she really knows the facts. And then at the end of the day, if we've given the information, we've offered help, we've shared the gospel, well, we've done all we can do. Mm -hmm. um, but if we withhold those things, I wonder how different, you know, how different is our voice in that moment of, of need. Mm -hmm. Now that's very helpful, and uh, and presumably, uh, if if people were interested in exploring something like that, mm -hmm. you, your organisation would be able to give advice and resources and uh, yeah. and, and help and that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. So we're you know, God willing, we're starting really very soon over the next few weeks in Norwich. We, we're we're working on the van. A support is helping us out with a. With, with kitting out a van for this. And so we're, we're, we're trying to get going as soon as possible in Norwich, but we're very much looking for churches to partner with to multiply this quickly. Uh, and yeah, we're absolutely ready to share our training and and equip the local church to do this ministry. That's terrific. Um, we've covered a lot of ground, I think. Um, just one other subject I think I'd like to just touch on briefly before we, uh, before we draw to a close, and that is... You've used the word a few times, um, the abortion industry, mm. um, and that may be sort of unfamiliar thing to people because I suppose we think of healthcare and mm. we very articulately say this is not healthcare, it's quite different. Um, in this country it's all under the uh, auspices of NHS mm. really, although there are specific clinics and so on, but, but worldwide, particularly in America and so on, there, there are businesses mm -hmm. run. <laughs> yep. Um, so actually, it, it is a profit-making thing. Yes. Um, but I've also heard you talk about the the very close links that there are and the synergy that there is, not just with the the, the explicit abortion industry, mm -hmm. but but the wider pharmaceutical industry, mm -hmm. um, in terms of um, uh, research mm -hmm. and the use of uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, aborted fetuses and body yeah. parts and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's something that. You know, has come up a little bit in, in, in some people's um, minds and in discussion, perhaps particularly related to the, the, you know, the, the big issue of today of vaccines mm -hmm. and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think probably um, the commonest thought is, well, yes, we know a bit about that. Mm -hmm. uh, there were things done in the 1970s, mm -hmm. the way yep. cell lines began, all the rest of mm -hmm. them. You know, um, we're a long way away from that. Right. Um, mm. And you know, I don't want to get into all of this is mm. complicated. Mm. There are complicated yeah. ethical arguments yeah. and issues to do with all of that. Mm. But I think the, the thing I want to just try and focus on is mm. um, what you've said about not the not the long distant past, yeah. not the yeah. the cell lines from the nineteen seventies, yeah. from the, the, the one particular aborted mm. fetus, the, mm. the whatever the number is, the, the, the kidney mm -hmm. cell, but actually mm. that. There's a great deal of that still going yeah. on. That there is yeah. there is actual collaboration between yeah. pharmaceutical development mm -hmm. and, and the abortion industry. And yeah. actually, there are monetary yes. contracts going on, and, yeah. and that puts a very very different slant on it. And, yeah. and, and I have to say that was that was an eye opener for me. Mm. So would you would you mm. just say a little bit about that? Because I mm. do think that that's mm. an, an important issue that perhaps we need to give a bit more thought to than we have. Yes, certainly. There's this uh, saying, isn't there? Well, that was a long time ago. There's this great distance. We're a long way from that. And, and, and the reality is that in the most important senses, we're simply not. We haven't moved on from that. We have a, uh, the culture of organ harvesting from babies continues today in great force. So uh, perhaps... So, 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 so the argument then that we are, uh, we're not proximately mm -hmm. involved in all the rest mm -hmm. of it, it, that may even be the case with regards to those things. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is that it's... it's it's actually going on now. That's right. I mean, you, know, you, you can't say that by my taking part in a, a cell line that was created 40 years ago, I helped to abort that baby. No, of course I didn't. Yeah. That baby was, was even born, regardless of what I do in my life. And, and that's not the point. The point is that the exact same thing is happening today. That, the, the, you know, abortion on demand and organ harvesting from babies is happening today. And this is perhaps most clearly seen uh, and this is very well documented um, in America, where Planned Parenthood have been caught on camera talking about how they will take orders for certain baby parts and they will go about the abortion procedure in a certain way so as to procure those specific body parts to sell on to third parties. 
So, so they're taking orders from who? They're taking the order from researchers, from, from you know, pharmaceutical, whether it be, you know, a university research a department or uh, some branch of a pharmaceutical company. But there are all sorts of people who have an interest in getting hold of fresh fetal tissue for, for research and for producing certain things. Now, we hear about stories coming from places like China, mm. where we talk, we hear about organ harvesting yeah. and people selling things and, and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. And, you know, pretty uniformly in this country, we, we're very quick to mm -hmm. say this is absolutely appalling. Yeah. Yeah. But what you're saying is mm -hmm. that something very, very similar, yeah. maybe the same, is yeah. happening yeah. in our country? Yeah, in our country, yeah. As well. Yeah, in our country. It's because of the way that, you know, it's all embedded within the NHS in our country, it's harder to see. And, and so we're trying to find out more detail about what's going on in this country, but certainly I can give you evidence of, you know, there's something called the, the SWIFT fetal tissue bank, there's the Cardiff uh, fetal tissue bank, and quite recently there are published studies about using what they call fetal tissue, organs from babies taken from elective abortions, as they put it, for research purposes. So we know that it's happening in the UK, hard to say how much exactly, but in the States, very well documented. In China, as well as the Uyghurs, the adults, you know, having their organs harvested, also babies as well. And I think a really important detail that people need to know about here is it's not as though, well, these babies, you know, they've been aborted, they've died anyway. Does it make much difference if we take their organs as well? Well, the reality is that um, these babies are often, uh, as I say, aborted in a certain way so as to get those organs precisely, to preserve those organs and, and to get an organ as fresh as possible. Because they don't want dead or... To That's right, you, there's no good to you. So we know, we know that babies um, have their organs taken from them before they've even died. So we're talking about live babies being tortured for their organs during an abortion process. I mean, that is, that is a staggering thing because that is, I mean, that is precisely what happens with organ donation, so somebody mm -hmm. who's, mm -hmm. who, who's brain dead and yeah. has been maintained merely on a ventilator, yeah. if, if organs are going to be harvested, yeah. you don't wait till they yeah. die, you mm -hmm. have to do that first, but mm -hmm. that's done under the most careful scrutiny, mm -hmm. it's done with consent, mm -hmm. it's done with yeah. uh, full knowledge, yeah. uh, but is this happening like yeah. that? Is, is a yeah. woman going into a clinic saying, well, we're going to we're going to keep your baby alive until we remove mm. parts of its mm. body to be mm. used on research. Mm. I mean, is, that, mm. is that happening? So in some cases, they may well get the consent of the mother, depending on which country we're talking about here. Yeah. But, but of course, they're not going to phrase it like that, are they? Yeah. We'll keep your baby alive, you know, get her kidney out, and then, you know, well, she'll be dead before long anyway. That, that, that They're not going to phrase it like that. They'll say, do you mind if we donate your fetal tissue for research purposes? Which sounds fine, doesn't it? You know, that's, that sounds like you're just donating an organ. But you see, what you're describing there is is surely something that must be abhorrent mm. to any Christian, mm. I would think, to mm. any decent person. Mm. Um, and, and it puts a different slant because if if we're thinking, well, pharmaceuticals that are developed with something from a long time mm. ago at a big distance, that yeah. that's one thing. But mm. and and that may be the case mm -hmm. in these particular things that we're talking about, particular mm. medicines, particular mm. vaccines, or whatever. But the fact that this is continuing, yeah. um, those two things are not unconnected, no, are they? No, no. It's exactly the same industry. It, it's continued right the way through. And, um, you know, recently, so uh, uh, Trump, when he was president, um, was restricting public funding for this kind of thing, for organ research you know, of, of babies. Biden has reinstated it. And I remember the New York Times specifically saying how valuable this kind of research is with fetal tissue because it's done stuff like yield our COVID-19 vaccines. So the, 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 it's very clear that there's a connection here. This is not ancient history. It's the same kind of thing going on today. And, and, and you know, be it the Biden administration, be it various university research labs and Big Pharma, they all consider organ harvesting from babies to be incredibly important. It's a very lucrative business. It's something they depend on. And uh, so they get paid for doing these things. So yes, well it depends on which country you're talking about, but certainly in the States there's federal funding for it. Um, mm -hmm. But there's, you know, there, there's also a lot of private medicine going on in the States as well. Mm -hmm. um, in China, of course, the state has a very strong hold on everything. So a fetal cell line called Wowbacks 2 was created in 2015, and that was with the help of nine 
babies who are aborted uh, via what's called a water bag abortion. They were delivered alive in the sack so that they could get the tissue as fresh as possible. So um, it depends very much on the country, but one way or another, there's a lot of money going around and uh, it's because this is considered to be very, um, very useful for, for research and for development of, of various medicines. I mean, it's very, very difficult to not um, see this as really just on a par with cannibalism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's very difficult to differentiate yeah. ethically yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, as well as yeah. um, mm. terrible violation yeah. of, of the integrity of the human body. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I think it, you know, public pressure can be very powerful, can't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, there have mm -hmm. been many, many changes in all kinds of industries yeah. because people have been up in arms yeah. about doing things a certain way. So, mm -hmm. you know, anti vivisectionists yeah. are very, very effective, mm -hmm. um, pulling on the heartstrings of, of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of animal lovers. Mm -hmm. um, and the result has been that they find different ways of doing things. Yes. Yeah. You know, the anti fur lobby. Yes. Uh, there's, yeah. countless, there's countless, there's yeah. countless things, isn't there? Yeah. None of none of which are anything like as yeah. important as precious as yeah. uh, uh, as human life. But I mean, mm. if if somebody like the Pope, for example, yeah. were to declare no Catholic can yeah. take a medicine yeah. that is had anything to do in its development with yeah. people, like, no matter how long ago it is. Yeah. The impact on what's going on mm. in the present mm. would surely be very great, yeah. wouldn't it? It would. Or if a country said, yeah. "No, we're not going to, we're not going to yeah. have this," yeah. uh, you know, in just the same sort of way yeah. as the whole world seems to be able to mobilise against um, fossil fuels, for yeah. example, yeah. and suddenly trillions of dollars become available yeah. to do something different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's not yeah. going to that issue, but, <laughs> but 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 it just shows what can be done. So Absolutely. the issue is not that something can't be changed, mm. and, and you know there are all kinds of. Uh, non-fetal stem cells. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. In fact, which sometimes in the past, in in, in, in previous administrations in the states, mm -hmm. I think have pushed mm -hmm. funding in those directions. So yeah. it's, it's possible yeah. to do much of the research mm -hmm. that they're doing, perhaps just as well, perhaps even better. Yeah. Yeah. W without mm -hmm. taking this shortcut of yeah. harvesting f organs from babies that are yeah. still alive. Yeah. Absolutely, and, I, and this is what grieves me really, because I think we've had over the last year and a half an incredible opportunity, and we've missed it actually, because it's not that difficult, as you say, to create vaccines without this stuff. Indeed, some COVID-19 vaccines have been created without fetal cell lines. Balneva, for example. Uh, Which unfortunately the British government cancelled its order. I know, and I don't know why, it wasn't very clear why they did that, but it may come back yet, we'll see. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, cure. It's a French. Is that a French, it's a French connection? Yeah. So, so it might be a it might be it's political. political. Yeah, it, yeah. I don't know what exactly, but you know, who knows? They've done so many U turns over the last year mm -hmm. and a half. You know, maybe that'll come back in. But you know, it, it's so it, it, it's so easy, mm -hmm. really, to do this without fetal cell lines. And you know, I think we had this incredible opportunity where you could have turned around and said, you know what, we're we're not willing to accept this. And this could have been the year it ended. You know, mm -hmm. this could have been the year where where the world said no. Um, to this practice once and for all, uh, and we haven't taken that opportunity. Um, and I think that's where, you know, I think a lot gets lost in translation, this whole debate about vaccines and so on, but what I want people to really understand here is we're not talking about ancient history. We're talking about real-life babies today who are being tortured for their organs so that adults could make medicines they want to make. And you don't even have to use those things to make those medicines. You know, it, it's not actually complicated. We need to stop this inhumane practice, mm -hmm. and uh, we need to insist that it's it's not morally justifiable to torture a child in order to help adults that's that's not a, a fair exchange mm -hmm. uh we we can and we must do much better than that and ultimately all of it comes back to an understanding of what it means to be a human life yeah yeah um and we would want to assert absolutely strongly uh, as christians that we cannot we cannot separate mm -hmm. the life from mm -hmm. the personhood. Yeah. This is a this is an entirely false dichotomy mm -hmm. that's been concocted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's part of a wider it's part of a wider um, uh, confusion, isn't it, mm -hmm. where biological reality yes. and yeah. something else yeah. that's right. uh, mm -hmm. is being completely separated. Mm -hmm. uh, you yeah. see the whole confusions around yeah. gender and, and, mm -hmm. and and all the rest of it, but yeah. it, it all comes back mm. to the 
preciousness of human life, which yeah. is made in the image of God, right. and who which receives its value mm. by virtue of its uh, creation in the image yeah. of God, and yeah. um, and God values these lives as precious, mm -hmm. and mm. God will um, will bring justice to mm. those who mm. who um, uh, who violate mm. that. So it's. It comes back to really fundamental yeah. issues, doesn't it? All, yeah. They're many complicated by ethical mm. things, but at the end of the day, there's yeah. a great simplicity yeah. um, about who decides mm. value in human mm. life. Is it us yeah. or is it Almighty God, the Creator? Yeah. Yeah. And as soon as we, as soon as we've conceded that latter, mm. then um, there's an awful lot of other things that we mm. have to say. Well, this is just not for us yeah. to decide. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. David, it's been great speaking to you. It, 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 it's uh, been very illuminating. I'm sure people will hugely appreciate um, your, you know, encyclopedic knowledge of of, of, of the subject, and uh, but also your your passion and your uh, commitment to this. And I think um, the church needs voices like yours. Um, we need initiatives like. Uh, like like Brefos, and uh, we need the challenge. Uh, we need the challenge and the, um, you know the uh, the thinking that that will that will bring. And I, I hope that our conversation will be uh, will be useful to that end for many people. And um, I'm very grateful to you for uh, talking with me just now. Very grateful to you for uh, being with us and for uh, helping uh, our church. And uh, if others wanted to um, to get in touch with you, wanted you to come and speak to them or their church or group or youth group or whatever, uh, tell us what to do. Tell us, mm. uh, as we close, where, how people can get in touch with you and where they can find out about Brefos. Thank you. Well, our website is brefos.org, so that's B-R-E-P-H-O-S dot O-R-G, and there you'll find some resources that are hopefully helpful for teaching about abortion, information about abortion. We've got some podcasts there to help people think things through. Um, and our contact details are there as well, so my email address, my phone number, and you can get in touch, and we would love to come and help in any way we can. We've got a, a team of speakers as well, it's not just me, we've got um, a team of, of, of volunteers dotted around the country, most of them are pastors um, in their own churches, but they're willing and available to teach sort of in their region, um, so uh, if I can't make it, uh, I'm sure we can sort out someone else in the team uh, to make it, but yeah, please do get in touch, we'd love to serve you any way we can. Great. Um, I should have I should have asked you to explain, but I'll just explain that the, the name Brefos mm. is of course a Greek word, mm -hmm. which is used for the baby mm -hmm. inside the womb and outside the womb. Right. Prominent in mm -hmm. first couple of chapters of Luke's Gospel, mm -hmm. where John the Baptist is the Brefos in the womb, mm -hmm. leaping for joy in the presence of his Lord, and mm -hmm. then uh, in the next chapter, Jesus is mm -hmm. the Brefos mm -hmm. when they find him in the manger, right. and uh, and you're making that point that the Bible treats both of these mm -hmm. as exactly the same same being, same yeah. person, same human. That's right. David, thank you so much. And uh, we uh, we look forward to uh, your continuing ministry and uh, I'm sure we'll speak again. Thank, thank you, you so much. Great to be on. Thank you.